welcome everyone and uh, I'm delighted to have our first guest speaker for the semester join us virtually from Chicago, right? Are you in Chicago still? Yes. So Doyle uh, has been very uh, inspirational since his visit last semester with his wonderful ensemble, the Spectral Quartet. They came to uh, UNT and gave a wonderful presentation. And uh, we really ran out of time for the amount of questions that students had. And so um, they graciously offered to extend uh, a, a, just an extra session for Q&A to be able to answer everyone's questions and have a, a little bit more time to just show us the behind the scenes magic of their organization. So thank you, Doyle, for joining us today. Uh, I mean, I would love to take credit, but um, I'm not responsible for this quartet. Uh, my quartet mates, uh, Russ, Clara, and Maeve are also here if they want to like wave or flail at the camera. So everyone Hello. knows where they are in the- Hello. Yeah. Yay. Welcome, welcome. Welcome everyone for joining us. I was on the speaker view, so I could only see, I'm glad to see now everyone else. Hi, Clara. Hi, Russ. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just dive right in. If most of the students in this class are not were not in your session last spring, these are new music entrepreneurship students. Um, so I'm curious if you wouldn't mind before we jump into the Q and A's, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing a little just overview of your organization. They all were giving your website to look you up and submit questions, but it would be so wonderful maybe to just have a little recap of your organization and your story. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> who would like to do that among the four of us? Uh, I can start, I guess, and then please, please, to my quartet mates, please, please jump in. Uh, so we're a string quartet in Chicago. Uh, we've been together now um, for almost 10 years. Um, uh, Doyle and I are founding members and Clara joined us six years ago and Maeve about four years ago now. And um, uh, we are a quartet who plays a um, uh, full spectrum of, of uh, music written for string quartet. Um, from you know very earliest music for string quartet to um, things that are written for us all the time uh, so we um, do programming and then uh, programming into different genres so to speak um, with different progress uh, projects as well um, we put on our own we produce our own um, series of uh, events in chicago uh, some of which are um, um, more straightforward uh, concerts, and then many of which are um, are more experience-based events centered around the music, and that's what we highlighted uh, in our talk last uh, March, right before the pandemic had actually, it was, it was the last thing we did before we went on lockdown, actually. Um, seems like forever ago and also yesterday. Um, <laughs> But um, we highlighted a number of those projects um, in sort of um, uh, with a, an eye towards um, building community in, in your own city, in your own environment um, with um, members of, of your communities um, and, and how we did it in our, how we do it in our community. Um, and I think we put a high priority on collaboration and on um, going out and finding collaborators who bring something new to us, who, who expand our artistic mission and, and our, and our breadth of understanding of music and uh, culture um, to new places. And, and, and so that was the, the gist of our talk then. I don't know if any of my colleagues would like to, to join in on that. And welcome Maeve. Sorry, I've met for, I didn't see you in the whole Hi. Nice the, to see you. Welcome everyone. Thanks for that, Russ. But if anyone sure. else from the ensemble would like to add anything, we can also hear. But that's fine. We're, we're eager to just dive right in and just get to the questions and, uh, and the magic behind your organization. And it's true that you were here right before the pandemic started 
wow, like it seems that so much has happened since your last visit. And I know I have a question that I would like to start right off the bat before we jump into all the other questions is how have you adapted to this challenge, right? How the things we, we talked about, the things you shared in your last visit, I'm sure that since then so much has evolved in your own organization and in the way you have been doing the things as, as a traveling ensemble and uh, and so I'm curious if you would maybe share with us, you know, what has happened since then and how have you adapted as an innovative quartet that you are? Um, I can start. So I think, you know, when the pandemic happened, um, the lockdown started, I think, you know, a lot of people were sort of, I think a lot of, um, a lot of freelancers like really got hit so hard right away because it was kind of like, I have this set of gigs that I have planned out. And once those dry up, I'm basically waiting. And I think one thing that I'm really proud of that our group did is we've tried to pivot really quickly onto finding ways to take some of the community building things that we've been doing, traveling, producing shows and figure out like so much of those events, the essence of which is not just musical, but it, it is about kind of finding ways to bring our community together to find new members in our community. Um, so we tried to come up with, we had like a big brainstorming session and came up with a bunch of different ideas for ways that we could do virtual events that didn't rely on us necessarily being in the same room or actually performing live, um, but still would give people that sense of interacting with us and giving them something that would sort of fill that, that gap that was missing of live performance. Um, so we started this series of online events and I'll just throw out a couple different types of events we've done. Other people can jump in. Um, one thing that we started doing kind of on a weekly basis was something we called the, um, the New Music Help Desk, which was basically just a very informal session where um, composers, students um, could come onto a Zoom call with us and basically ask us questions about notation, um, questions about score writing, uh, performance practice, anything that was kind of just they needed help on and we sort of were just there we'd have a guest composer join us um and basically just be sort of on call to help with um any questions that came up we've also been doing a series of sort of listening parties that we call the floating lounge where again we'll have someone in our community a, a composer or another uh, performer come on and basically show up with like a playlist of music that really inspires them and then have a bunch of um different excerpts that we listen to as a group and discuss. So, you know, thing, things like that where we're not actually live streaming a show from a hall or from our rehearsal space, but we're trying to find ways to kind of offer people something that doesn't feel like necessarily a class or a lecture, but is still giving them some insight into our process and the people that we work with. Yeah, and maybe one thing to add on to what Maeve is saying is that, you know, obviously every musician has had to pivot in some way um, as we've kind of wrestled with this idea of being, you know, stuck at home. And a lot of what we saw early on um, was great, um, but it was also very one directional. So it was very presentational um, of I'm going to play for the camera and you may listen to me, um, which is lovely in its own right. Um, we tried to find a way to make things more interactive. So both of the series that Maeve is mentioning really tried to kind of bolster this idea of getting the audience involved. And so we're using the raise hand feature, the chat feature, um, and trying to make it more conversational so that it wasn't just, you know, just listening, but it was actually getting reactions from the audience. And I would say that that's an offshoot of kind of everything that we do. Our concerts do tend to be very interactive, whether they're more traditional or something a bit more out of the box. And that's really a high priority for us. So that's something we've tried to bring to this online version of things. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I'm going to let some of the students ask some questions. We have some of them that were submitted in writing. So um, I can start with some of those, but I'm also going to let them chime in. But uh, let me start with, let's see here. This one's from Rachel. With COVID, we're seeing that it's easier than ever to connect and create across city, state, country lines. Um, have you felt like the experience of the pandemic has made you want to double down on even further on 
locality and invest musical time and energy in Chicago when in-person events have resumed? How has your relationship as an ensemble to other arts organizations in Chicago been affected by the lack of in-person opportunities? And then this summer you launched two fully online community experiences, the Floating Lounge and the new Music Help Desk. How do you see these experiences functioning as part of what your ensemble offers going forward? So lots of questions in there, but. Um, yeah, that's a lot of questions roped into one. Um, I'm happy to start somewhere. Um, so to the idea of Chicago and um, locality and uh, being a part, really a part of, of our region and our community, I think that's something that's always been really important to us. And I think even more now because um, back to what Maeve said about, you know, freelancers being hit really hard, I think there's no question that we are also trying to figure out how we are going to sustain ourselves through um, a time that we don't know, you know, how long it's going to end. However, I think now more than ever, we are seeing how all of these um, like seeds that we have planted in the community are, are really coming back to us. Um, launching some of these digital events, it was really unclear you know, just what kind of audience we might have for these. And we've been really, um, I think it's, it feels, uh, I feel like, the, like uh, approaching this with a lot of humility because I feel like um, we totally are here now um, because of the support of our community, because we were able to reach enough people over our 10 year lifespan as a group um, and connect with people in such a way that they felt passionate about still supporting us during this time. And so uh, that's, that feels like, um, you know, to have uh, what's meaningful about your art pointed out to you by your audience is is really rewarding and something not to take for granted. And so certainly I think, although we don't have any direct plans to share at this moment about how we're going to be uh, connecting to community in Chicago um, going forward, that's always been a really strong, important part of what it is that we do and we'll definitely continue to do that. Um, and connect connect with the uh, I look forward to connecting with some of the partners that we've developed over these years and also trying to branch out thank you thank you so much yeah so Jenna has a question it says COVID-19 all of these questions are COVID-19 they start with COVID-19 <laughs> COVID-19 has presented challenges among artists and reaching audiences. What challenges have you faced and overcome during this time? How have you found any positives concerning virtual events? Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> the new music help desk that was mentioned, um, I think is a really good example of this. I mean, I, I would like to think that all of the stuff that we've been doing online has been widely available. Um, to a, a larger reach of people than we can possibly hope to um, be in contact with when we go to a specific city and play a concert or even with our own concert. But one of the things that I really loved about the help desk um, is that we would have a special guest. So we would have an amazing co composer like a, you know, a Marcos Balter um, or with the listening parties, like we had George Lewis uh, come do a listening party and in some ways it's it's almost kind of a microcosm of like what social media did for all of us which is that it brought people that felt um out of reach closer and so you know we had composers showing up to these help desks uh from all different walks of life from all different levels of schooling and things like that and there was kind of a, a beautiful kind of democratizing i think that happened with that that this is a free event, this is available to anyone. And, you know, in, in typical life, 
um, a university that can afford to bring us and play student works or give a presentation as we did at UNT, um, that's, that's sort of the barrier to entry, right? And so there are many, many other composers out there who have amazing ideas and amazing things they want to do um, that might not have that access. And so that was one of the positives that I found in it is that, um, and it's actually something that we've talked, um, even though we can't share specific plans with you right now, the help desk is actually something we've talked about taking forward because of that reach and because of that making something available or bringing a really special composer as a kind of mini mentor, I guess, for a moment, you know, for an hour and a half, um, that you as a person that's not necessarily um, paying a tuition um, can have access to you and perhaps like answer a question that's been, you know, scratching your brain for a while. I think another thing that kind of, I think a lot of times we try to lean into informality, no matter what the event is, whether it's live or not. A lot of times, you know, even when we're, um, in you know a big call doing a more standard program we're talking to the audience one-on-one -on -one or or you know us to the audience in a more personal way and i think in in some ways like as frustrating and awkward as it can be um we've kind of tried to use zoom to be even more like letting people into our process um in the in the course of this pandemic we finished editing mixing mastering and release an album and we actually got to sort of do events online where we had our listeners here, you know, we took them through the process hearing raw audio. We sort of did these workshops where people could really see, you know, the version of us that's not just on stage presenting a fully rehearsed program, but is also, you know, doing entrepreneurial things, thinking about, um, you know, putting out recording projects. And so I think that's been sort of a silver lining of um, not being able to perform as we usually do and not being able to travel is that we can kind of you know, we can, we can use Zoom, um, we can use these virtual events as a way to kind of show people behind the curtain even more. Um, so that's been something that, that personally has felt special to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have a question here from Raquel. She says, um, as a group versus being just one sole performer, how do you cultivate a brand and core values in a way that all of you could be represented while still staying unique and appealing to a specific market? I think this I is can, always a ahead, point please. of conversation for us. Um, I'll start and yeah, please um, jump in or us. Um, it's really important, I think, to us that we have a really cohesive brand, um, but also that all four of us feel represented in that brand. And that really just comes down to a lot of conversation, um, a lot of conversation. Uh, Maeve was mentioning the album that we just put out. Um, I can't even tell you just hours and hours and hours of talking about just the most um, most tiny details, because to us, it's, it's uh, important that all of those details come together to create uh, the user experience that it does. Um, so that's just one example, but uh, we work together uh, to come to what our brand is uh, in a way that I think is very active. You know, we have um, 10 years of putting stuff out in the world to rely on, you know, that has kind of built the story of our brand, but at the same time, we're always making little tweaks. And uh, so Doyle is kind of our um, self-proclaimed minister of propaganda. Uh, so he's ultimately sort of responsible for a lot of the th things that you're seeing and reading, but a lot of debate goes into that before it's put out in the world. Thank you. I have a question here from Anna. What is your vision for the future of classical music? The world moves forward and the majority of the audience contains elderly people. How, in your opinion, can we bring it to younger public, younger audiences without giving up its complexity and deepness? That's so a huge solve, question. Solve the issue of classical music? <laughs> That's a huge question. Ross, did you want to start? No, but sure. <laughs> I mean, I can start if you want to like just fill in my, you know. Yeah, 
major voids. Um, you know, when, when we talked uh, at UNT, when we were there last time, I understand a lot of you were not there, um, but a big kind of thrust of what we were talking about um, is really meant to be practical, which is like, if you are going to start an ensemble, if you're going to start an organization in the arts, like, why should you do that? Or when do you know that it's, um, it's a good time to do that? And I think the answer to that is similar to the answer to this, which is that um, the future of classical music to us, um, it, it's many things, but one's kind of central tenet of this would be that if the music and if the experience is not speaking to our experience of living today, um, then something is, is missing. It becomes um, something that is lovely, um, but that is something akin to going to a museum perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, don't, I don't say that at all to disparage old music because God, we love it and we play it all the time and it's a huge part of what we do. But what I mean is if you're just bought into that idea of programming traditionally in the way that it has been for, you know, whatever you want to say, centuries, decades, um, that it's only, uh, it's only sort of fulfilling one purpose. And so for us, the future of this music is that we celebrate our tradition um, but that we also offer people something that speaks to what it's like to be alive today. And so we do that both in the way that we sort of curate a concert, right? That the experience of being at the concert is something that feels current, um, but also with the music, you know, that we're actually programming music that is 100% talking about some issue that's going today, whether that's explicit or whether that's just a function of the fact that the person writing it lives alongside of us you know in this era well and the point the point too is i mean you sort of touched on it and i'll just take it a little further is that it's this it can be and should be a living tradition right we, we talk about it often as a dichotomy between tradition and new but the the tradition is 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 happening right i mean it's being built as we build it and so the reason why i feel that in some more larger legacy classical institutions, the audience is older is because that's a specific cultural experience that resonates with people who grew up a certain way with certain values and ideas about what entertainment and art should feel like and look like. And it's just something that grows over time. And you have institutions that sort of put it in amber or, or, you know, or, you know, try to keep serving that audience and don't, necessarily understand that um that like that progress of or man, progress is such a loaded word it, that that tradition doesn't just stop in 1927 or whatever you know um and so like the the art that we curate now so pro people who program concerts and 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 symphonies and whatever like i think they in order to read it reach the young a younger group they have to they have to represent that group. They have to, I mean, they have, their programming has to be open to the values of the newer generation. And then those people will show up, you know? Uh, and it, maybe it's just a different way of saying sort of what Doyle was saying, but it, it, it's like, um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Can I jump in on that for a moment, actually? Um, so I think maybe, uh, Russ, give me a thumbs up or not. I feel like what you're alluding to is that it's not just about programming. It's also presentational and how... Um, yeah, the whole experience is a cultural experience, right? And there's like little tiny signifiers that tell certain people that they're not, they don't belong in that. There, there's, you know, whether they mean to or not, it's right. So, sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll, right. I'll no, start. that's exactly right. It's a, um, I think when we think about the typical classical music experience, it's, it's one that's very formalized and, and has become, you know, uh, has its own traditions and way that you should or should not approach the music. And that is something that we are always trying to get away from in what we do. We don't believe that uh, going to a concert should be a silent anonymous experience. We try to cultivate experiences with whatever programming and whatever music that we're bringing um, that are experiential, that value community, that value feedback. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's just it actually, I'll stop there.
Thank you. This is so, so valuable. And it actually, this question ties in perfectly to the next question from Dawson. He wrote here, how has your quartet dealt with conflict within the group? How have you experienced different differences of vision, values, or structure? And then what is the role of your string quartet or quartets in general in the larger socio-political environment in a splintered 2020 USA? Y'all are bringing the big questions today. <laughs> yeah, there's I know, right? They came ready. <laughs> well, maybe one really just kind of a, a short version of the um, answer to the first question about conflict. I mean, I guess like any hopefully functioning relationship that has some longevity, I think, you know, it goes back to what we were saying before about just like so much communication. Um, and that is not to say that we, you know, always communicate on in a way where we're like always on the same wavelength a lot of times it is sort of taking different perspectives and trying to compromise or trying to like work through it in a way that lands us at a a result that we all feel good about and i think that's what it comes down to is that even if we're disagreeing about a certain um, aesthetic thing or something in the business it's like all four of us are here because you know all four perspectives are necessary for us to have the composite thing that we present to the world um so I think it is just a lot of like talking through things and making sure and I just that add to that just one little tiny thing Maeve, just to insert like, like the pro like what you're saying, like the process of seeking consensus, right. It keeps us buying in. Right. It's like, yeah, totally. it's like, it's like that process and the recognition of, of differing opinions and priorities is, it, it, you know, if not for that, then, then it would be a lot harder. Totally. And I think like with any, again, with any sort of group that has a common aim, it's like if the, the moment that you stop seeing the value in having those other opinions coming at you from those people that you've also bought into, whether you agree with them or not, the second that you lose the value in that, then you're not really functioning as a group. Um, and also just on a more practical level, I think, you know, Claire said the word feedback a couple minutes ago, and that's something that is so huge for us with our with our audience, but also with ourselves, you know, after concerts, we oftentimes we do, you know, call them postmortems and we really talk about what happened, what went well, what didn't go well, what did people say to us after the show? Did we feel good about all these aspects? What, you know, what can we push ourselves to get even closer to next time? And, you know, we also, we, we find time, you know, it's never enough, but we find time periodically to go back to our mission statement, our values, sort of principles that we've built the group on and, and kind of just do like a, a diagnostic of sorts and say like, you know, are we achieving these things that we said were important? Are, you know, have our values changed? Like what, what are we doing well? Like what can we keep stretching ourselves to do? So some of it is just sort of kind of doing the checkup and, and taking stock of where we're at and making sure that we're all on the same page about what we want aspirationally. Yeah, and in terms of the, you know, current cultural situation that we find ourselves in, um, you know, I, I think that there's there's obviously this touchstone that happened, you know, with the, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that has given a lot of organizations a chance to sort of reassess their programming. Um, you know, for us, this is something that, that predates that. This is something in terms of the way that we want to treat inclusivity, the way that we work with BIPOC composers, the way that um, we try to get outside of the sort of white male composer-ness of classical music um, is something that we've been at for a while. And it's something that we feel really strongly about and not just because there was this big cultural moment, but just because that's something that seems important. It gets back to this idea of like, what's the future of classical music? Well, maybe it ought to look like our culture right now. Um, and so that's, that's something that is really um, always a part of what we're thinking of too, um, when we're presenting, when we're thinking about even where to perform a concert. Um, and I think that, I guess I'm grateful for the fact that there is sort of a cultural reckoning happening right now um, for a lot of institutions because, uh, you know, un kind of for better, for worse, maybe unfortunately, it, it takes sometimes a really um, kind of 
flammable cultural moment uh, for some of these bigger institutions or more entrenched institutions to to take a look at this. And if it does result in some meaningful change and let's say lasting change, especially, you know, not just something that happens now, but something that carries forward to the future, which I'm hopeful that it will, um, then I'm, I'm grateful for that moment. Yeah, and um, just to be super clear about it, um, Doyle's right, we do have a history uh, considering some of these issues um, as an institution, but there's always things that we can do better. And there are certainly blind spots that we have that are being exposed in this moment and things that we're learning from and trying to do better. Um, Maeve mentioned uh, that, and it's something that we're doing currently actually is working with a consultant to uh, revise our mission and vision statement and create some operating principles um, that will be a document to come back to uh, when we find ourselves going astray or have a, a question that, that really bears um, going back to uh, a, this document that can serve sort of as like a, a witness or, or as a, a way to hold ourselves accountable to some of these uh, standards that we're creating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have here a, a question from Liliana. She said, with the emergence of COVID-19, musicians have had to depend on social media and other online venues in order to continue promoting their craft and company. However, on the positive side, becoming more of an online entity has proven to eliminate any traveling obstacles, thus becoming more accessible. As a performer, do you see this as an advantage or disadvantage for your career? Uh, I mean, in the in the near term, it's a disadvantage because all of our money went away. <laughs> uh, um, I think in the long term, it has so far like our our. The ranks of people who are in our database, just to put it crassly, who, who, who have come through the door in the last few months are grown faster than ever before um, because we're, because now people, the, the, the borders, you know, are, are not geographical anymore, right? Um, so we're bringing people in and, and having new members of our community who are, who we wouldn't have reached before. Um, so I think it, it kind of depends on what happens in the next 12 months, I think, as to whether or not it'll actually turn into an advantage. Yeah, and maybe this is a super idealistic way to look at it. Um, and who, who knows what it will actually do for us tangibly down the road. But I think just on a holistic level, you know, having to pivot, having to think about, you know, having, having to really push yourself to think about creative ways to keep doing some semblance of the thing you're doing having to figure out like how does my role as an artist like still stay viable when I can't get on the plane and go to the concert hall and do the thing that I usually do I think that like just the the process of those brainstorming sessions and like learning how to sort of do a different type of production than we're used to learning how to you know engage with more technological stuff like that versatility I, I hope will no matter what happens on the line will still be assets to us Yeah, and um, I mean, I hope that this does not take the place of live performance. I don't think it will because it's just not the same thing. But if our digital offerings can be a way for people far and wide to get to know us better as people so that, you know, a year from now, they might show up at a concert and feel like they are already invested and already bought in and already have some kind of sense of who we are as a group and who we are as individuals, then that is all for the better. And I really hope that we get to that place. Certainly, certainly. What could you, uh, what could you advise our students here who are trying to create their own versions of their, you know, their own businesses in music, their own ventures, their own, you know, performing organizations, their own solo careers, uh, their own 
educational organizations, schools, online teaching, knowing now how different the music industry feels and, and looks and the new realities and the new challenges we're facing, if you could give them some advice of how they could structure their businesses to be almost the pandemic proof in a way, you know, how could they perhaps envision alternative income streams that could go around their artistic endeavors so that they could rely on those when things kind of take a turn, which are so hard to predict, but to basically what, what, if you could, if you could talk to your own quartet a year ago, you know, and, and tell yourselves, we could create these additional income streams. We could diversify the things we're doing. Uh, almost like if you knew this was happening, like what could you have done at that point while you were, you know, well, not a year ago, let's put it 10 years ago when you were starting your quartet, you know, in your organization. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on ways that our students now who are in this place where they're, you know, starting, if, if, if they could envision how to create an organization that would be ready for these sort of economic downturns. I'll let you know when we find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's a I don't know how to answer that question I mean it's I mean what I say is almost true it's like it's like uh, we th there is no pandemic proofing in the arts I, I'm not sure um, in my opinion uh, all, or I haven't uh, maybe I'm not thinking expansively enough to think of what it is um, I think for for us right now it's coming back to relying on the people who you've, who've who you have um come in contact we've come in contact with over many years so like in terms of starting out i don't i don't know what to say about that but for us like like we're we're projecting in this year a very scary budget scenario um one that you know, only will keep us in business um, if this doesn't drag on for too, too long. Um, just to be real about it. Um, and what is keeping us going that far is our community, is people who, have, who are donating, honestly. People who are, who are able to support us um, and also, you know, relatively conservative financial management over the last few years and, and, and good fortune in terms of having more opportunities in the last few years to, to sort of help us build a bit of cash. I don't know. I'm, I feel like I'm flailing with this answer because it's, it is a very, very hard question. I, I don't know. Um, I, I might take it and, jump in. Yeah. yeah. Just to kind of build off of what Russ is saying, because I don't, I don't think that we're the best people to answer the question. How do you make yourself pandemic proof? I mean, early on, you know, a couple years into uh, forming the quartet, we decided that we were going to step away from basically most or all of our teaching and freelance work uh, to focus all of our efforts on the quartet. And at this point, for the four of us, this is, this is our job. This is our income. We're not freelancers. We're, you know, we're the Spectral Quartet and that's our job. Um, but if I could pivot just a little bit, um, because hopefully an eventuality like the pandemic right now is is something that hopefully we'll experience once in our lifetime um you know i i think when you're when you're considering to start your own group um or to develop a life in the arts it's you know there's a an element of versatility that's helpful we talk about that a lot um especially with undergrads that like this is the time to really get familiar with contemporary music to get familiar with styles of music outside of what you're learning in school um, to become one of those very few people that can be called on when that job appears um, that has that sort of like skill set, right, to be able to take something on. Now, that's sort of a generic way to put it. But another way to put it, especially if you're thinking about starting an organization, is how do you become indispensable to your community? Like another way of saying what Russ is saying is that there are people in our community that we've built over 10 years that consider us indispensable, that really want to see Spectral Quartet thrive beyond this given moment. And 
the ways that we've done that are not just by putting on concerts that people find entertaining, right? But it's about trying to really become a part of the community that we're in for people, especially in our area in Chicago, um, to really see us as kind of one of the cultural institutions here, you know, something that they can rely on. They know that they're going to get a, a full concert season every season from Spectral Quartet. And that's not something that a lot of quartets do to have a full season in their hometown in addition to all of their touring. And that's just one example. But I think that idea of like making, uh, finding your niche by like figuring out who it is that you're serving, right? Who are the communities that you're hoping to serve and how do you become part of that where you're not just sort of a guest on occasion, but actually a part of it, I think is one of the ways that you make yourself indispensable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's something that we're all thinking now, you know, as we're looking into models and, and ways to kind of evolve and pivot. And uh, I'm curious to know if you have considered um, any like outdoor performance venues or things like that, that would allow your quartet to still have like a combination of the online offerings with uh, in person and settings that would be considered comfortable for people. We've been in um, um, a maybe a, a, a different situation than some ensembles this summer where we, for another reason, had to take some time off anyway. Yeah. Um, and so we have not been in a position to, to really even think about performing live um, outdoors or whatever during the last few months. Um, and then, you know, now that the weather's changing in Chicago, um, it'll, the, the time will escape us quite quickly where, where we can be outside, um, safely and comfortably, um, with the instruments and all that. Um, so that hasn't really been much a part of our discussion yet. I imagine that if we're in the same position, once the weather warms up again, um, up here that we will be talking about that, um, and maybe things in between, I don't know, but. Um, it's we we've we focused our efforts on on doing things virtually um, you know the things we've already talked about um, for that reason or that's one of the reasons okay yeah that's true the weather is a big a big factor in, in Chicago okay so I'll uh, I've got a few more questions here from students and then I'll let anyone else chime in. Um, Matthew asks, um, I think this question has already been answered, but how, how has your ensemble been able to adapt with changing constrictions on audience sizes and allowance? And how have you been able to reach your audience in a virtual format or ways that you have not utilized in the past? So I think you've already kind of answered this question. But Matt, if you would like to maybe add on to that question and just as, as you've heard them kind of talk about this. I don't really have anything to add. I think they already discussed it. Okay, so they already answered that question. Okay, I think I'm, I've gone through all of the written questions. Uh, Oh, Raquel had one more question. She said, as a music ensemble, at what point uh, in the progress were you able to launch to perform at other locations outside of Chicago? Or how did you start performing at different locations within the city? I'm curious on this part of the process of networking. Do you reach out to venues? Do they reach out to you? I've answered the last couple, so maybe I'll toss it to one of my colleagues here. Would like to answer that? I'm happy to talk about some of it, but I don't know how to answer the. Um, I can feel like Russ and Doyle, your best position to answer the when did we start performing outside of Chicago question. Uh, sure, I can start with that, and then Clara can kind of take us into what that looks nowadays. It's like as we're trying to raise our profile or play in, you know, sort of more notable. Uh, concert halls and things like that. Um, when we first started out, uh, we had 
zero budget. Um, and so we were looking for places that we could get for cheap or zero dollars. Um, so we were leaning on like Russ and I both attended Northwestern University. So we we're doing some concerts uh, in one of their halls. Um, but then maybe more notably, um, we decided early on in this idea of trying to engage a wider audience and a younger audience. Um, we actually reached out to venues that like had shows that didn't look anything like ours, uh, but were places we really loved going. So in Chicago, um, if you're familiar with the city, the Empty Bottle is sort of a, a storied punk club um, that now has all kinds of music, a very pretty small space. It's sort of like the CBGBs of Chicago, if that's a reference that doesn't fly over everyone's head. Um, and also uh, the Hideout was another one, which is another really like much beloved venue in Chicago. And really it was, it was people taking a risk on us. And honestly, there was enough novelty at that point 10 years ago for a string quartet to come in and play sort of an indie rock venue that um, they were at least willing to talk. And then typically speaking, we would show up and we would, you know, we would pack the place or we'd at least have a really healthy audience. And so some trust was built up that way um so yeah it was really it was very diy in the beginning um and it was i think in a lot of cases like we would know one person you know once or twice removed uh that had some affiliation with the venue and uh we would sort of lean on that and at least get someone talking about it but i'll pass it over to clara to talk about what that looks like these days um, yeah, so when I joined the quartet six years ago, we were still doing all of our own bookings. And so it was me and the other violinist at that point who um, really spent a lot of our time researching deeply uh, this very question, how other people are getting the gigs that they are. And one of the things that we used to do is sit and uh, basically think of all of the people that we were um, felt like either we were in a peer group with in terms of career or people who were like maybe just like next level up and we would stalk their websites and see where those people were playing and then look up those venues websites look up who the program director was or the artistic director and just send cold emails um i mean hunt like hundreds of cold emails and uh that you know got us so far um was not always successful, but I uh, was still, I think, um, important step to take and did, uh, did get us somewhere. Um, these days, uh, we are in our third year of working with a management company. Um, that said, uh, it's been a, a kind of a learning curve for us that a uh, management company does not do everything for you. We still, um, come to them with a lot of our own opportunities and, and bookings because of work that we're doing to try to get our name out there. And ultimately, um, I think particularly for a group like us, because we do so many different kinds of programs, I do feel like in most cases, we are going to be the best people to sell ourselves and our own product because uh, we're the most familiar with all of those intricate details of what it is that we can do. And so I, so I kind of do our, our programming um, for the group. And that means trying to, uh, well, with assistance from Russ um, a lot of the time. And that means trying to maintain relationships uh, with presenters, with other artists who might have their own concert series. So it's just kind of like trying to stay in the scene enough even digitally you know trying to show up for other people's events and make sure that your name and your face is being seen in different kinds of spaces and then taking opportunities to try to speak with people um one thing that i think is uh something i want to tell you because it uh was a really important thing to learn for me is that a lot of times you will not know when a conversation pays off. A conversation you might have now might pay off five years from now. And it might be annoying to you in the meantime that it's taken so long, but uh, you, you never know uh, what conversation you might have that might lead to something. And for us, it 
often has and often has taken longer than we might have wanted, but it's still led to good things for us. Clara, Clara gets a lot of coffees and has a lot of lunches and they... <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, not now. Um, but yeah, I just, I actually want to highlight something that Clara said just to make sure everyone really heard it. Um, and that was about being somebody that shows up. Um, it's amazing when you do end up approaching a presenter or another group for advice or any of these things. If you're one of those faces or names that people know because you're at shows and you're asking questions and you're showing support, um, people talk to you differently than if you're just some rando off the street. Um, so I think it's an important part to show that you're part of the community and it, it, it will sort of pay dividends down the road. Thank you so much. This has been really, really wonderful. Uh, I'm glad we had all these insightful questions submitted ahead of time. And uh, if you have any final thoughts that perhaps you'd like to share with our students as they are, many of them uh, embarking on just creating their ventures this semester and creating business plans and starting their projects, both uh, for themselves as well as in groups this semester we're doing something interesting where students are co-creating plans and coming up with things in a collaborative environment uh, and uh, obviously they can apply these skills to their own individual businesses but we're doing something more uh, more ensemble like where they're working in teams and kind of collaborating uh, and just envisioning what would be new models for the music industry what would be models that would allow them to sustain themselves in a way that is financially, uh, you know, financially realistic as well as artistically fulfilling and uh, highly adaptable to rapidly changing environments. So if you have any thoughts on any of any of this that you would like to maybe share as we wrap up today's session, that would be wonderful. Oh, maybe one just broad thing and that I'll throw out there and I, you know, I think we did touch on this a little bit um, when we were there in person at UNT, but, um, you know, I think like for a lot of us who grow up playing music and sort of going down a traditional route, whether that's conservatory or, you know, music degree, like a lot of times, by the time we get to this age where we're thinking about what our future looks like, we've sort of been told that there's this set of paths. There's, you know, soloist path, orchestral career, or maybe you play in the jazz combo or big band, like there's these sort of fixed um, models and, you know, sometimes those are really what we want to pursue but i think a lot of it is just default it's what we've been told um is in front of us and i think if you really want to be viable and you know the best thing you can do is decide where you want to be and then actually listen you know try to find like where is the gap in my community like where is there a need because if you can find that space and then figure out like what resources do I need to be the thing that my community needs in this way? Like how can I take my skill sets, the things that I learned in school and actually serve the place that I'm in? I think it, I mean, on the one hand, you're doing a really great service. And on the other hand, I think it, it has a high chance of feeling fulfilling in a long-term way because rather than trying to, you know, sort of be vying for the same types of positions um, that are dwindling or are, really competitive or like, you know, are changing now with, with the way that our, um, our world is looking that, you know, there's something to be said for trying to actually identify, like, where am I needed? Where can my skills actually make a difference? Because then you'll find a niche for yourself that has uh, more longevity to it. Yeah, I'd like to add to you that, you know, if there's always this question when you're trying to get something off the ground is like, you're looking around you at different organizations or different ensembles and being like, how did they get that gig or how did they make that happen or where did they get the money for that? And if, if I had to point to one thing and my colleagues, please tell me that you feel differently, but from the beginning of the quartet till now, I would say that a lot of our biggest leaps were made as a result of collaboration. Um, and that doesn't just mean artistic collaboration, but collaboration is a way in which you can align yourself with someone that is higher profile than you is one aspect of it. Um, you can open yourself up to an audience that you wouldn't otherwise have access to if there's somebody that comes from a different community, for instance. Um, and it, in the ways that we've treated that, hope, I, I think maybe the most salient thing I could say to you about that is that what we've tried to do in all of our collaborations 
is really invite the other person in to kind of teach us. So not just, hey, we're putting on this concert, like come dance in front of us, you know, would be sort of like the, the dumb version of that, but really something that, that feels really integrated where we really develop a relationship with that collaborator. Again, this could be artistic, this could be with a board member, it could be with a donor, it could be with a mentor of some kind. Um, but by giving that person the space to really show you what they're all about, it really creates a much more, I think, fertile territory um, for amazing ideas to come out with. And, you know, these, these questions that you're wrestling with, it sounds like, how do we adapt? How do we do something different? Those are really big questions. And you kind of do have to get outside of your own sphere, I think, maybe to come up with, with good answers to that question. Um, I'd love to just throw in two quick comments. One is that um, focus on the things that you can control, like what there's so much that is outside our control right now, maybe more than ever before. What it sounds like this is probably very related to what you're already doing, but like what are assets that you can focus on accumulating or making better for yourself during this time like do you have a website can you be making your website better can you be polishing recordings that you might have is there a place that you might be able to get into that where you could make another recording are you writing enough music um, are there ways that you can be collaborating with people even in a digital way um, that's not one-to-one -one? Um, so are is your cv current is your bio current um, even really small seemingly small things like that, use this time to really make sure that everything about what you might call your uh, portfolio is ready for the next opportunity that you might have. And then the second thing that I would say is just that, um, you know, at the end of the day, all of us have had non-musical jobs at some point in our lives, and there's no shame in that. You can still call yourself an artist and be making art um, and have a non-musical job, uh, even if that's for, you know, a small period of your life or forever. Um, I just think, I think sometimes when uh, you look at um, some of your artistic heroes, it's something that uh, maybe people don't talk about, that there are sometimes these holes in our, in our lives where we might be doing something else for a period of time, and then we come back to uh, these we find a way to make uh, our careers line up with our art, but that's not always the case and it doesn't have to be. Thank you everyone so, so much. These are so helpful answers and such a great discussion. Please let us know how we can follow you, support you, help raise uh, you know, awareness of all the things that you're doing as an ensemble what is the best way to help you and support you as your organization? Should we like your social media pages? Should we share them? What are the best ways that we can also individually and collectively support you? I think the best way is just to sign up for our email uh, messages because uh, you'll learn about um, these projects that we're doing. You'll learn about the next events that we'll have that you can be a part of and, and participate in. Uh, you can do so um, usually for free in most cases. Um, and we'd love to have you all, and some of you are part of our regular uh, community. I see some, some familiar faces here and uh, we'd love to have more of you uh, join us. Thank you very much. So we have here your website with the, with the email sign up. This is what we will do. And, and you can steal our ideas. And we encourage that. Steal Indeed. our ideas. Like <laughs> anything, or do it better. Do it better than we're doing it. You know what I mean? Like that's that's one of the good things about staying in, in touch with what different ensembles are doing is it might spark, you know, some thought, whether it's a similar one or something, you know, completely different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Thank you very much for your time. And uh, this has been great. We Thank really you. appreciate it because we all wanted to have more time last spring. And so we're so grateful that you have ge so generously giving us this extra time. Thank you. And we wish My you pleasure. all the best and we will continue supporting you, following you and spreading the, spreading the you know, beautiful things you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Thank you. Really great to see you all. Bye.